Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are going back finally to Final Fantasy VIII. I've had this one on the docket for a long while. After we did our Final Fantasy XII deep dive, the next one I had on my list was the very controversial, apparently underrated Final Fantasy VIII. And much like any other Final Fantasy game we've covered on this channel, I went into it entirely blind. Because to me, that's what makes it exciting. All I know is this is the divisive one. And look, I know a thing or two about divisive Final Fantasy games. If you haven't checked it out, I'm a big defender of Final Fantasy 13 and 13 too. I think those games are overlooked and misunderstood and people would actually appreciate them more nowadays. So Final Fantasy 8 fans, I understand you. You're talking to the right guy right now. So did Final Fantasy VIII resonate with me from its very strange gameplay systems to its absolutely bonkers, we're gonna do whatever the heck we want because we made Final Fantasy VII story? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, so let's not delay any further and get into it. If you're new here, you're into nostalgic and retrospective content, you're in the right place. Consider subscribing, we got a lot of other Final Fantasy retrospectives up on the channel if you wanna check those out. But let's start off with the gameplay here for Final Fantasy VIII because I think the approach here is really unique. The idea of a game from 1999 having some of the most unique character build potential that I've seen in a JRPG is not something I expected. Swapping out equipment for the Guardian Force system was bold. Instead of doing your standard JRPG stuff, your armor, your weapon, your accessory, and so on and so forth, they say, to heck with all of that, Magic is your source of power. You're gonna equip fire and it's gonna up your strength. You're gonna link it to these guardian forces and you're able to diversify your builds. I made Squall more strength focused, Renault was more magic focused, Irvine was more defensive focused. And so they each had their own roles in battle and the team compositions were fun to create even if it kind of doesn't eventually matter who's in your party. But it's definitely confusing as a first timer, like 100% reading through the massive amount of tutorials in this game. I was pretty confused until I went hands on with the system. That's not even getting into the redundant part where as party members swap in and out, you have to constantly swap and exchange junctions. It can be a bit tedious. And then you go to the flashback points with Laguna and then you got to swap them out again. You're constantly redoing your builds because everyone is sharing this same small set of summons and spells in the game but we'll get to all of that in a moment i really do like the idea on paper especially because it plays into the summons for final fantasy in a really unique way so it gets a little convoluted when they start to introduce hey you can take this fire and link it to your stat okay simple enough or your elemental defense or your elemental attack or you can apply a status effect it gets over designed eventually and why understood what was happening i just would rather you give me a weapon that i could loot that had fire on it instead of giving me fire spells to then link and have percentage increases there's just a lot of mathing a lot of synergy things that the game never communicates to you and nowadays you have guides so it's a lot easier to understand but if you look at this game in a silo oh my god i feel bad for everyone trying to play this game at launch it tells you almost nothing Perhaps the thing that left me most mixed, now granted, you can lean into like triple triad and, and really scale your characters quickly and kind of eliminate all of the gameplay, which is another problem we'll get into. But when I look at the junction system and how a lot of the game's dungeons and bosses are designed around having just the right build, having just the right answer. Again, I know there are ways you can steamroll, but I'm looking at this from someone who's trying to play the game, not play it like a visual novel of sorts. There are often times that you will need an electric attack answer and maybe you have the spells linked but you don't want to use the spells because you don't want to remove your stat bonuses and so you kind of just sit there and that's where it feeds into the draw system. This is where the game starts to kind of lock itself in this very much stasis chamber in my eyes because you go to enemies and you fight them. You want to draw the magic out of them and that's the way you're going to grind. Now, in my head at first, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna level up while I do this. This is great, like, okay, cool. Especially with the remastered bells and whistles, I can turn on some of the battle hacks, I can multiply the speed of the battle, I can turn off encounters when I'm done. Great, okay, I can get behind this. So I grind, 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 level up, level up, level up. I just learned I made the game way more difficult for myself because the game's always scaling, so you don't wanna level up and you don't wanna battle, but you need to farm, it's so 
backwards, even if it's so unique. Like, I see all the potential in it, and I don't think that Square Enix should just fully walk away from this idea. I think they could reuse it and make it a lot better, but they just completely disable the reason for the player to fight. One of my favorite components of it, though, reminded me of Lost Odyssey, and this is one of those things that I do hope would carry over into later Final Fantasy games, which would be the skills, finding a guardian force, linking with it, learning its skills, selecting what it's gonna progress towards next. This is great because it reminds me of in Lost Odyssey, you had the mortals and the immortals. And so you would link these characters with each other and the mortals would learn skills from the immortals and you would have these really unique builds. You can almost cross contaminate crazy classes. And I felt a little bit of that here. But what happens is eventually you can start to make spells through items and using the abilities that are unlocked through scaling the guardian force. I found that out about 10 hours into the game, 15 hours into the game, where it just kind of came out of nowhere and I went, oh, this is a good answer, but then why would I ever battle? Especially because now I'm making things way more difficult for myself and you throw triple triad into the mix. The game just constantly defeats itself on a gameplay level where I love the ideas. I think the execution is just really bad. But what I don't want to overlook is the other aspect of the time capsule, which are things like the cutscenes in this game. I have such a soft spot for the cutscenes in this game. I love how they transition into these movies, but your characters are moving around while the scene's playing out behind you. They, of course, change things. Like, if you look at the character models from Final Fantasy VII, the more polygonal dudes versus what you get here in Final Fantasy VIII, at least in the remaster where they really cleaned up the models compared to the original version, I would say that this was a major upgrade, right? Like, matching the body you see in combat where, like, Cloud was fully formed, if you will. He wasn't a bunch of polygons versus what you got in the overworld. It matched things a lot better. I mean, I think of that cutscene in the Battle of the Gardens where you're running through with Renoa and everyone's fighting in the background. That was legit awesome still to this day. It has great cinematography, which is not something I expected to be saying about Final Fantasy VIII, lest a game from the late 90s. So I think that's enough about the gameplay. I actually want to get into the complete box experience. It's a pretty cool one. And then we'll talk a lot about this story. And here we have a complete inbox copy of Final Fantasy VIII. You know what's so funny is when I saw Squall and I saw Cypher, I thought, oh, there they are, the Kingdom Hearts 2 characters, right? <laughs> that was my only familiarity with these characters. I was surprised, like, oh, Selfie is also from Final Fantasy VIII. Like, that's the interesting part is me starting with Kingdom Hearts when I was a really young kid and then going back to Final Fantasy all these years later. I realized what characters just went right over my head in those games. But anyway, let's read the back of the box where it says... A member of an elite military team, Squall is forced into a conflict beyond imagination. That's definitely an understatement. To survive, he must contend with a desperate rival, a powerful sorceress, and even his own mysterious dreams. Realistic and detailed characters and backgrounds, graphics enhanced by a breathtaking musical score, an epic story based on the theme of love set in a massive world. I think like every Final Fantasy game at this point is a love story of some kind. It's like definitely the, the series trope in my eyes at this point with everything I've played. Continuing on, they say a new junction system allows characters to be customized with powerful magic spells drawn from enemies. Nearly an hour of stunning motion captured CG cinema seamlessly integrated into gameplay. And as I love with these older, thicker, complete in box copies in the jewel case, you not only get one little manual, but you get two that we're gonna go through here. So the first one is the actual game manual. The other is a mini walkthrough that I'll showcase. You can see here just the, the beautiful disc art with Renoa and Squall. But let's take a look at this manual here, which indeed is illustrated. You have a Dia right here, front and center. A lot of cool colors, illustrations, all that stuff, but also a lot of time spent on explaining the junction system, like 10 plus pages, you'll see. So here they have a prologue. At the forefront of the rising tide of violence brought on by Galbadia's war declaration is a seed cadet named Squall Leonhart. Serious to a fault, Squall has earned himself the reputation of being a lone wolf. A chance encounter with the free-spirited Renoa Hartilli, however, turns his universe upside down. Having thrived on discipline, Squall finds Renoa's carefree attitude fascinating, yet there is no time to ponder these thoughts. 
for the job of dealing with the sorceress behind Galbadia's irrational hostility has fallen to Seed and Squall. In Final Fantasy VIII, the player will assume the role of Squall and Laguna to advance the story. At times, Squall is known to fall into dreamlike state. It is during these periods that he encounters Laguna. What destiny awaits these characters? At what point does the story cross between the two and who is Laguna? None of those answers, in my opinion, are satisfying. However, I do like one thing they talked about here, which is like the serious nature, the distance, dreamlike state. And I know they're talking about when you go and experience the Laguna side of the story. However, I do like that Squall's always thinking. He's rolling around in bed. His thoughts are bouncing around. He just wants his brain to shut off. And in a lot of ways, I think Squall and much of this world could probably relate. But let's continue on. They have the main characters here, Squall and Laguna. You continue on, you see Cypher, Renoa, Kestis, you have, or Quistis, sorry, you have Selfie, Zell. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what is the point of Zell? What, what does this guy do? Seriously, outside of punching the air, doing a little shadow boxing, what does Zell actually do? And then you have Irvine, who he was so cool at first, but when that man didn't pull the trigger, <sighs> Irvine, you almost had me there. On the next page here, we have vehicles on the world map. We have modifying weapons, receiving a salary. One of the weird parts of the game is like, as you make certain choices, your seed rank will either go up or down. And that's how you get money. You don't get money from beating up enemies and random encounters. You get it from selling stuff and you get it from your salary, which I thought was kind of cool actually. But when you want to buy stuff and you can't control your own fate because you need money. Um, yeah, that, that kind of stinks. But let's continue on. We have... The menu screen breakdown here, everything you're going to be seeing in the game from the character's names and a level to the hit points. And they continue on with more and more of that. Now it's onto the battle screen where they break down all that you're going to see within the windows themselves. And it's here that we get into the junction system where you see it starts at page 24. And I mean, the game spends a lot of time with the tutorials, trying its best to explain it to you. The tutorials sometimes being a little deceptive where you think like oh man like it set it up for me great i get it but you actually have to go in and redo what they just did but you see we're still on the junction system here and now it's over to triple triad which is a big addicting component of the game as they get deeper into triple triad and they start adding new rules it kind of ruins it for me but triple triad is pretty dope at first it makes me excited for the new final fantasy 7 rebirth card game that they're doing here but they also break down triple triad note how that requires a page pocket station and then you have squall here on the back with squall and renoa here another iconic shot for the game in cypher on the back so that is the manual but wait surprise surprise as i said earlier there is a little bit more we have the mini walkthrough from brady games which i thought was cool here uh, get this so you get all these little free pages here which is nice and they tour you through the seed garden, lots of pictures, all that stuff. We'll skip to the back here. And where does this cut off? But the fire dungeon where you fight a freak, which is the first cave in the game. So it does not take you very far. And then they try to sell you on the strategy guide here. I thought it was pretty cool that they showed off Chocobo Dungeon 2 and Chocobo Racing. I actually didn't even know about these games at all, but they exist. And then here they have Final Fantasy Anthology, which... I didn't know has CG cinemas and bonus music CD for Final Fantasy VI, which I love VI, so I might have to pick that up. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is it when it comes to slips and sleeves and all that stuff that you'll find in here. You'll find behind the discs a really cool art, which I definitely appreciate. Like a very thoughtful complete in box experience, in my opinion. We'll pull out the disc one here. Just awesome stuff here. So always, always love a good PS1 complete in box, but that's everything you get in Final Fantasy VIII. The first two and a half of the four discs that are in Final Fantasy VIII, I think Square was kind of cooking. I love the mystery of Final Fantasy VIII's world. What is the garden? What is a seed? What is the secret behind seed? Who is Laguna? How does he link to Squall? Why am I seeing this dude's past? Why are we connected at all? Who is Renoa compared to the rest of us? What is the backstory of all of these characters? The entire story and world, everyone within it, is shrouded in mystery. And at first, they had me in the first half as they're gradually peeling back the layers in a way that makes sense of, okay, we're Seed, this mercenary group that's being deployed on special operations. 
I can get behind that. That reminds me a lot of Trails of Cold Steel. Class 7 gets to go out in these massive wars and fight battles on the behest of the Erebonian government. I'm like, okay, I can really get behind this idea because I love Trails. And then when you mix that in with going to Timber and planning an assassination mission, suddenly I'm like, okay, this is a, a politically enriched plot where you have Adia, you have the president of Galbadia. Like, okay, I like where we're going with this. But then they just go left on everything and there's no great answer to any of the mysteries from who your party members are to getting shot in the friggin' space. There's, it's such a we're gonna do whatever we want type of game in the second half. It's amazing how much it transforms before your eyes. Like I talked to my friends who had played Final Fantasy VIII as I was going through my playthrough. I was about halfway through and I went, I don't see any problems at all. Like I'm kind of critical of the battle system, but this story is awesome. They're like, just wait, we'll see how you feel at the end. That's all I heard. We'll wait till you see how you feel at the end. I'm like, okay, if it goes on this track, I'm gonna love it. I did not expect them to go left quite like this. Let's get into the thick of the moment to moment like we always do in these Final Fantasy games. At the heart of this story is Squall, your main character. And as everyone knows by this point in time, Squall is a douchebag. This guy doesn't care about anything. And the reason the game provides this as you crawl deeper and deeper through the story is Squall has been hurt bad growing up. His, quote, sis, end quote, abandoned him. I wonder who that is. And therefore, he feels lonely. That pain is deep within him, and he doesn't want to bring anyone close because when he got close to someone one time, when they stepped away, he was left cold, callous. And so whenever anyone interacts with him throughout the entire story, he's extremely distant. He's king whatever. He just doesn't give a damn about what you have to say, and the conversation couldn't end soon enough. Now, at first, I'm okay with this because I don't mind that Squall has room to develop. He is cold and cut off at first. You can see Renoa and the rest of the gang like at the festival just going to play instruments for Squall and trying to lift him up. They go to such lengths for this dude and he's continuously ungrateful. So I'm waiting for this payoff. And even in that moment where Renoa is crying into Squall's arms, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I need you right now. This man is the most incapable protagonist because he's just straight up a destructive element. He's the toxic friend you cut out of your life. Like, dude, there is no helping you. Go talk to a professional at this point, Squall, because us as friends clearly are not doing enough for you. This man can never get beside himself. Now, there is the, to many people, big payoff at the end when Squall cracks a smile at the final, final cutscene. He's made some peace with himself. To me, wasn't worth it. I didn't play all of that just to see this man smile. I played all that to see him start opening up a little bit more. And he does have its moments where I'm cheering for him. I'm like, yes, Squall, finally, dude. I started to want for these characters. But because there was never delivery on the other aspect of it, I just felt so let down. For example, the kind of forced feeling romance between Squall and Renoa. I always found weird, like Renoa sort of seemed to be into Cypher, and then all of a sudden she's very much into Squall, and Squall's cut off from her. He's like, whatever, I really don't care that you're into me. I'm like, okay, this guy is not going to fall into the love trap. I kind of respect where this story is going, and as time goes on, the Battle of the Gardens happens, Renoa falls into a coma, and Squall hits the switch. This is where I thought development was going to finally start happening, because in my eyes, I thought this is the time where Squall realizes what he had was great. And I think that is a theme that many people can get behind is appreciating what you have in the present. Something that Renoa was big on. She was like, let's just focus on the now, not the future. We don't know what's going to happen. Let's just enjoy each other now. And it's not until she falls into a coma that Squall feels that because what he had was gone. It's in those moments that his cold, disconnected nature really works. But it's because once he makes that change into a leader, it feels far too late, far too forced. And even in the most emotional moments of the game, he's still way too cold and disconnected. It feels like they took the emo cloud and put him up to 9,000. And this is what we got. So I'm a Squall Defender for the most part because I can see some good in him and I can see the vision. I just think much like the rest of the game, the execution wasn't 
quite there. One of the most noteworthy parts of the character development for Final Fantasy VIII is the basketball court scene. This one is that first image that comes to mind when I think of Final Fantasy VIII, but it's also the moment I went, what are we doing here, guys and gals? What are we doing here? So at this point in the story, you learn that Adia, the main villain of the game, the sorceress behind all that is going wrong in this world, is Yamami. She ran an orphanage. And guess who's from the orphanage? Everyone in your party except Renoa. Okay, I guess I can suspend my disbelief, but everyone doesn't seem to know why we don't remember each other. Isn't this supposed to be an important part of our childhood? And at first I thought like maybe they're going to lean into the trauma of Squall and that's why he has forgotten things because he's been so hurt emotionally. He's disconnected himself. Wow, I was on a whole different wavelength. According to Irvine, who's just a bit upset that everyone else forgot about him, but he kept it caged up on the inside because let's tell everyone now, after we've sniped a sorceress, you know, we've gone to war together. Now I'm going to let you all know I'm a little upset that you kind of forgot me. By the way, we're all family members if you didn't really know that. According to him, it might be the Guardian Force. It, it might be the links we established. So it, it siphoned off some of our memories growing up. It just felt like they had no answer for the great mystery set up. And so they just went, write something in there. Oh, that works. Great. So it's a great moment in the way the picture is set up where they're all hanging out in the basketball court. But it hurts so bad watching them try to string together mind-blowing revelations when they don't feel foreshadowed really at all. And what makes it the more topsy-turvy experience is the music is authentically good. When I met Renoa and I heard that theme hit on that train, I went, oh my god, that's one of my favorite tracks in all of Final Fantasy. It is so good. Man with a machine gun, Laguna's battle theme, needs no introduction at all. That's an absolute banger. I'm sure I'm saying things that people have said for decades now. But seriously, this soundtrack kicks serious butt. I can't get enough of it. I updated my Spotify playlist. I was like, I want this, 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 and this. It's a commonality amongst Final Fantasy. The soundtracks are always great. But this one is nothing to overlook. It's great stuff. And... That's what hurts is you hear the emotion and the passion in the music and then the script, the character development isn't there where it feels like I should be feeling something. My body desires to feel something for these characters, but I can't be bothered because the development fails me too often. Ultimately, Final Fantasy VIII lacks tremendous story focus. When you look at how it's building up in the sequence of events where you start off as the student of this academy going out on missions. Your first battle is at the behest of an army, so you're thrust into war. You see the different opposing sides. You then get deployed on a secret mission to Timber, where you are to team up with Renoa to take out Adia, this sorceress, and assassinate her. And you're like, okay, what's the reason behind this? Wow, we're getting really into the thick of some deep, dark missions. You thrust in the aftermath there of Squall being tortured. The rest of the crew is trapped. You learn that these missiles are being shot out to the Balam Garden, so you gotta go after you finally escape captivity. And so the team splits off into two, one to the garden, one to the missile base. The missile base has incredible music as you make tactical decisions on the fly that can impact your seed rank. And then eventually that place blows up. There's this moment of, oh my God, did I just lose half my squad? Meanwhile, it's complete chaos at the Balam Garden. And there's pandemonium within as you're seeing people decide whether they're a part of the Garden Master's plans or Headmaster Sid's plans. And you're clearing all these rooms in the garden. You're tasked by Sid to go to the bottom of this facility and activate a mechanism. And it's there you discover that Norg is the head of the academy. It's like right there, it's the first going left moment of, what? Why is, who is this dude? What? Who are you right now? It, you run things here? And I'm thinking like, okay, like maybe it's like a secret alien race. Maybe they're the real antagonist. And then you talk to Sid and he's like, yeah, man, we hit it off. He bankrolled the whole operation. I'm like, this was just a business conversation that you guys had. That was it. What kind of revelation is that? Later on down the stories, when you learn about the orphanage scene, I was telling you about how Sorceress Adia was the matron of this orphanage and how she was actually being mind controlled by Ultimisha, a sorceress from the future who has the goal of capturing Alone, who is this little girl from this vision that you're seeing with Laguna. So you head to Great Salt Lake, where Adia is now a party member, and I thought this is a cool full circle moment. And then you find this 
hole in the sky that you crawl into and suddenly you're in Esther, this futuristic city. I'm like, what is happening right now? Okay, okay. You know what? This place artistically looks cool. A futuristic society. All right, fine. I'll allow it. Let's keep on pushing forward. This has to be the end of the weird. Maybe this is why people like the game. And the reason you're going to all these crazy lengths is since your encounter with Cypher, something happened to Renoa. She just hasn't woken up since. And Squall is distraught over this. I'm thinking, okay, a little development here, as I mentioned earlier. And so you go to this futuristic city and you think like, okay, you probably got the technology to help us out here, right? Like, please fix Renoa, guys. And where do you have to go to help Renoa out? But the lunar base. You know how you get to the lunar base? You get shot out of a damn cannon. Are you high, Square Enix? What was going on in the studio when this happened? They freeze you in a chamber. They shoot you to the moon, and you're on the moon base now. This game is absolute insanity at times. And part of it, I dig. I'm like, this is crazy. But what's frustrating is I hope I've illustrated well to you that first buildup to the assassination mission and then the torture scene afterwards and then the missile base and garden sequence. I'm like, this is such good stuff. The way the story is building, they just need to deliver on the mysteries and we're good. But they just continuously got more and more weird where those answers continued to disappoint. It gets completely insane. Now it's here you have one of the better moments of the game where you ever know of floating through time and space. And if you don't catch her, it says that she's lost to space forever, which I thought was a little funny. But as you catch her, they have this intimate moment in the ship. A ship, by the way, that randomly appeared, like the definition of Deus Ex Machina. I'm like, oh, Ragnarok. Hi, hello. How are you? Okay, I guess I got my flying ship in my Final Fantasy game. Let's check that box off. And so eventually you come back down and they're like, we got to take Renault away because these sorceresses just seem to be a problem for us, y'all. So if you don't mind, we're going to take her with us. Renault was cool with it. Guess who's also cool with it? The guy who just got shot to the moon to help her out. He's like, yep, yeah, I guess so. And everyone in the party comes in and goes, Dude, Squall, what is wrong with you, bro? You just, why are you going to leave her there? So what does he do but cut her free and takes her out of there? It's like, oh my God, man, who wrote this story? But now we need a plan to take out the main, main villain, Ultimicia. Okay, what do we do to do this? Let's go meet with the president of Esther, okay? Who do you think the president is? It's Laguna. I'm like, what the hell? I thought this dude was like my dad. Maybe he kind of is. There are points in the game that insinuate that he may kind of be related. Uh, I thought maybe he was squall in another timeline, squall in another dimension, so on and so forth. With this whole time compression thing ongoing, I'm thinking maybe there is this more direct connection. This dude's the president of Esther. I'm like, are you... Were you guys just low on assets and you had to throw some able body in there and so you chose the guy you were linked to through the past, throughout seeing all his events in these visions. I just, I can't find the words. What happened? What ha This game is, that's what I mean. I hope I'm painting a picture for you all. This game is so, so weird. <laughs> that I get why people like it. I know I sound like a negative Nancy here, but it's such a perplexing game in that it was so focused for like the first 40%. And then they just went, Dude, we already did that with seven. Like, what if we just made aliens control all of these schools? What if we made the president this character? What if we shot you to the moon? And to that, I guess I say, touche, Square. You did what you wanted to do. When people dig that this game just goes hog wild. For me, though, I just... It's really tough. Even as a Final Fantasy 13 defender, it's really tough to love Final Fantasy 8. I like parts of it. But this is, I have to say, one of my least favorite Final Fantasy games when it was all said and done. Not even mentioning that boss gauntlet at the end, which I know people are going to say skill issue, build issue. You can hit me with all the issues you want. There's like a million bosses at the end of this game. It stagnates any pacing that the game had left and I think hurts the grand finale for Final Fantasy VIII, where there is a sense of closure. To me, I actually felt something more for Laguna in that final scene than I did when it came to Squall, but this story was just so all over the place. There was no focus after a certain point in the game, and not only that, but the combat just couldn't hold up long term, and oftentimes it was more worthwhile to not do combat. So this excursion into Final Fantasy VIII, 
Weird time for sure, but worthwhile. And now I can kind of go on to the likes of Final Fantasy IV, like I've really wanted to, with a clear conscience. So what do you make of Final Fantasy VIII? I'm really looking forward to seeing your thoughts. Fire away down below. Certainly you've heard enough of mine. I'm looking forward to seeing your thoughts once again. And with that, take great care of yourselves. Peace out.